Hi, I'm Greg Peterson and I am a type 1 diabetic. I'm also a husband, father, farmer, a YouTube video producer, speaker, traveler, writer, musician, and athlete. Uh, I refuse to let type 1 diabetes define me uh, or let it slow me down or limit me. I wanted to make this video just to uh, help correct some of the misconceptions that people have about type 1 diabetes. And I also wanted to make this video for newly diagnosed uh, type 1 diabetics or, or people who um, are trying to learn more about type 1 diabetes um, just to kind of give them something to, to help with expectations and, and knowing what it's going to be like. So type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease uh, where your pancreas essentially turns on itself and uh, destroys your body's ability to produce insulin. And insulin is what regulates uh, the blood sugar in your blood when you um, eat or as you go about your day. Um, a, a normal person's functioning pancreas uh, keeps that blood sugar level at a, at a constant um, throughout the day. A type 1 diabetic's pancreas isn't doing anything, and so uh, we need insulin to survive. Type 1 diabetes is also called uh, youth onset diabetes because um, it's typically um, diagnosed at an early age. A lot of kids um, get type 1 diabetes, um, but in some rare cases, uh, you can get type 1 diabetes in your 20s or your 30s, uh, which is what happened in my case. I was 26 when I was diagnosed. So if you have type 2 diabetes, um, that simply means that your, your body's pancreas is still functioning, um, but it doesn't use the insulin well anymore. And so um, the difference between type 1 and type 2 is that, that type 1, uh, you, you don't really do anything to, to bring it on yourself. It happens due to factors out of your control. Uh, type 2 can be brought on by a poor diet or um, lack of exercise or, or lifestyle choices. Um, there's other factors as well, but, but that's the main difference between the two. Um, also, type 2 diabetes, um, you can uh, reverse that in some cases um, through different methods of, of you know, changing your diet, changing your lifestyle. Uh, type 1 kind of is what it is. Um, you can definitely make it easier to manage by making certain decisions, but it's not going to be reversed. There's no cure as of now. There's also uh, gestational diabetes, uh, which is like uh, pregnant women um, develop uh, diabetes and their blood sugar um, is, they have to manage their blood sugar that time. And um, there's also pre-diabetes, which is the stage before type two diabetes. So um, there's, there's lots of different diabetes um, and they're, they're all very different. They're not the same disease. And it's almost like, I feel like they should be named uh, a different disease. It shouldn't all have the same uh, root name because they're all very different. So only 5% of diabetics in the United States are type 1, the type that I have. So, um, you know, most of the people who you know who have diabetes probably have type 2. Uh, type 1 diabetes is pretty rare, um, but at the same time, as I've gone around on speaking trips uh, and met thousands of people all over the country, I run into quite a few other type 1 diabetics, and chances are uh, you probably know at least one um, in, your, in your community or, or amongst your friends. And so um, it's a rare disease, but there's also quite a few of us out there. So let's go over a few of the myths um, that I have found that exist about type 1 diabetes. So the first myth is that um, I brought type 1 diabetes on myself based on my decisions or, or my lifestyle. And when I got type 1 diabetes uh, three and a half years ago, uh, that, those were some of the, the things kind of said toward me in questions of, well, what what'd you do to make this happen? And uh, the reality is that type 1 diabetes is, is completely out of my control. It was, it was bound to happen to me. Um, I, I couldn't necessarily avoid it. Um, however, that being said, um, there, there is some speculation over whether uh, certain events in your life uh, can trigger type 1 diabetes. Um, but most people think that genetics uh, is the main thing, is the main role, um, and, and that's why type 1 di diabetes can be passed to the next generation. However, there was no one in generations before me that had type 1 diabetes. So it's very possible that my environment um, growing up or even into my 20s could have triggered uh, type 1 diabetes in my case. Now, I'm not a scientist, so I don't, I don't know everything about it. Um, but it's, from what I understand, type 1 diabetes, is, it's a balance between genetic history um, and your environment. Um, in fact, viruses um, such as the coronavirus or other type of coronaviruses have been known to trigger type 1 diabetes. And so that is one of the, one of the 
potential causes. I don't think we know for sure. And even if it triggered type 1 diabetes, that doesn't necessarily mean that it caused it. It could still be in your, in your genetics. So number two is that um, you will pass diabetes on to your kids. And that's not necessarily true. If I have three or four kids, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that all three or four kids will get type 1 diabetes. I, I do plan on having kids. My wife and I are expecting in September. And I hope and pray that, that our, our daughter doesn't uh, get type 1 diabetes. But if she does, um, at least we will be well equipped. Myth number three is that type 1 diabetes, aka youth onset diabetes, uh, only happens to kids. As I mentioned before, I was 26 years old when I got diagnosed, and I was perfectly healthy, perfectly fit, had no underlying conditions. It just happened. And so um, it can happen into your 30s. It can happen when you're a very small child. Um, just because they call it youth onset doesn't necessarily mean that you're a kid. Myth number four is that you can cure type 1 diabetes through diet or lifestyle. And uh, I think I got this a lot when I was first diagnosed, is I had so many people inputting information saying, well, I heard if you only eat this or if you, uh, you know, do this, then you can fix type 1 diabetes. And like I said earlier, um, you can manage diabetes uh, better or worse, but you can't really fix it. Myth number five is that sugar and carbs um, are, are bad for you and off limits. Um, while sugar and carbs are, are harder to manage, uh, maybe than avoiding them, um, it doesn't mean that the type 1 diabetics can't eat sugar or carbs. Uh, in fact, when we go low, when we have low blood sugar, we actually need to eat sugar and carbs. And so throughout the day, um, if I'm ever um, going low, uh, the last thing I would want to do is, is avoid sugar and carbs because I need those to get me back to uh, a manageable level. And so um, my diet that I consume and, and the diet that's healthiest for me is, is it's the same recommendations as, as someone without type 1 diabetes. Um, the nutritional requirements and, and what's healthy for me doesn't change because I have type 1 diabetes. Um, it's just, uh, it just affects the ability I have to manage my blood sugar. It makes it harder or easier. It doesn't, it doesn't change my, my health or my nutrition. So myth number six is that insulin and pumps um, are cures for diabetes. So this is my um, artificial pancreas, is this insulin pump right here. And um, you know, some people say, oh, you got a pump. Well, you're, you know, you, now you don't have to struggle with type 1 diabetes anymore. And while this was a life changer, this pump was an absolute life changer for me, um, it does not make my life easy. It does not take away the constant battle to manage type 1 diabetes. Um, it is simply a treatment for type 1 diabetes. It, it helps make life easier, but it doesn't make life easy. Myth number seven is that um, if you go high or you go low, uh, blood sugar wise, it means you're not taking care of yourself. Um, this is one of the most common myths that I still deal with uh, today is that I'll, I'll be out somewhere and I'll, I'll go low and need to eat and someone you know, will get worried about me like, oh, you're not taking care of yourself. And uh, it is true that, that if you're constantly low or constantly high, um, that's not good for you. Um, but an average diabetic on an average day is, is probably going to have at least one low and high. Um, that's just the way it is. It's, it's a constant uh, roller coaster, and you just got to do the best you can to manage it. Um, but, but having a low, having a high, that's, that's not something that's super detrimental. It doesn't mean I'm not taking care of myself. Uh, in fact, I can be eating a very healthy diet, um, but if I don't type in the right amount of insulin, I can go low or high. Or I can have a, a great exercise day um, or, and, and not do the right amount of insulin and still have a, have a bad insulin day. Myth number eight is that um, people will say, uh, oh, you'll outgrow it or you know, it'll get better um, as you go along. And, and um, neither of those are really true. I, I do think you get better at managing it as the years go by, um, but your body also changes. And so um, it never really gets that much easier. It's, it's always a constant battle day after day, year after year. Um, some people have had type 1 diabetes for 30, 40, 50 years. And I'm sure they would tell you um, that, that it's not really any easier 50 years down the road. It's a constant battle and it's, it's just something that you have to live with. And, and you're, you're never going to outgrow it. It's, it's always going to be with you. Uh, that is until hopefully maybe someday they could find an actual uh, cure. And of course, technology could also get better um, over the years. It is what it is right now.
So myth number nine is that it is contagious. Uh, it's not contagious. We talked a little bit earlier about how you can pass it on to the next generation, um, but it's not a guarantee. Um, well, as far as it as passing it, you know, from me to you, standing next to me, um, it's not that type of disease. Um, it's it's not contagious at all in that sense. Myth number 10 is that um, it limits me. And that is the myth that I'd like to focus on for most of this video because um, while type 1 diabetes does make my life harder, I do not feel like it limits me from doing what I want to do. Um, and that's, that's something that um, you know, people will say, oh, oh, you have type 1 diabetes, like are you gonna be okay doing this? Or are you gonna be okay eating this food? Or are you gonna be okay playing this sport? Or, or doing this and that? And, and it's like, yes, I'll be fine. Like it may be a little harder for me, I may have um, some challenges with it, but it's not gonna keep me from doing what I love to do. So my diagnosis story um, goes back to October of 2017 um, when I was in Billings, Montana watching my wife Brooke Anna um, be a cheerleader at a football game. And um, I was drinking hot chocolate and I remember um, my vision started to blur. And I've always had perfect vision um, my whole life and, and uh, you know, it just felt like things were starting to kind of merge into each other. I, I, was, I was really starting to feel strange in my eyes and uh, I was really fidgety. Um, and then I remember uh, that night, I went to the bathroom like 10 or 11 times um, overnight. Um, and I was, I was really struggling with, with thirst. I was just really thirsty. I was just drinking gallons of water. Um, and, and I knew something was wrong. Uh, with me and I had to drive home from from Billings as a 15-hour drive and I just felt terrible and so I knew something was wrong and I googled my symptoms and uh, I realized that I most likely had um, diabetes before I even went to the doctor um, but that next day after I got home I went to the doctor and they they took my blood sugar and uh, a normal, pers normal person's blood sugar with a functioning pancreas is supposed to be 70 or 80 uh, mine was 720 and so um, it was very, very high. Thankfully, I did not have any sort of uh, coma that was um, induced by um, hyperglycemia, I think is what it's called. Um, I didn't have a coma or I didn't pass out or anything, but um, yeah, it was, it was a shock. Um, it was, it was, um, I, was, I was very angry. Um, I was in denial a little bit. Um, I was very frustrated. Um, it's kind of a woe is me type feeling uh, when you get diagnosed. And I'm sure anyone who's watching this who was recently diagnosed is going through those same emotions. Um, I want to encourage you to, to sort through those emotions. Don't be afraid of them. Uh, work through them. Um, but don't, don't dwell on them longer than you have to because um, it's, it's not going away. Your situation is not going to change. Uh, the best thing you can do is to, to press forward, move on, and, and uh, figure out how to, to live your, your new normal. Um, and that's one thing I really want to encourage you guys uh, is that, that the new normal comes back. Normal life will come back very soon, um, but your life will never be the same once you're diagnosed. So there's no going back to the way it was, but there is a, a very new, healthy, exciting, enjoyable, uh, normal life for you to come in the future years. When I first got diagnosed uh, with type 1 diabetes, I did uh, really avoid carbs and sugar uh, for a while. Um, basically because it's really hard to manage uh, diabetes at first when you, um, you know, eat lots of sugar and carbs. Um, but as I learned how to use the insulin pens, as I learned to count the carbs I was eating, uh, I gradually was able to eat more and more carbs and be a little bit more aggressive with my diet. Um, everybody's different when it comes to diet with type 1 diabetes, but there is definitely, um, the, you know, the, the myth that you can't eat carbs. That is, that is um, definitely not, it's not real. And so uh, once you get to where you can um, count your carbs and, and manage those carbs well and give yourself the correct amount of insulin, um, I, I feel like today, uh, three and a half years later, um, I, I eat the same diet that I was eating before. Um, and it's, it's um, just as healthy for me now as it was back then. It's just, it's just harder to manage. I started out right after I got diagnosed uh, with type 1 diabetes. They put me on insulin pens, which I would, uh, you know, take some skin and you'd put the insulin pen into your skin and squeeze it and insulin would go in your skin and it would lower your blood sugar. Um, that's essentially what insulin does is it, it converts your, um, your body's blood sugar and carbs into to energy. And so that's, that's kind of how insulin works. 
Um, and, and when your pancreas stops making insulin, you've got to have, have man-made insulin uh, put into your body. So I started out on pins. I was only on insulin pins for maybe a couple months. Some people like insulin pins and they stick with insulin pins for years and years, maybe their whole lives. Um, and I think it's a different situation for everyone, but I would highly recommend you at least look into insulin pumps. Uh, my insulin pump was, was a huge uh, game changer for me. Uh, it made things so much easier for me um, just because I always had it with me um, and it always tells me my blood sugar and it actually um, gives me uh, different amounts of insulin based on what my blood sugar is. And so um, the pump was a, a huge game changer for me and that was really what um, got me back to my normal was my insulin pump. All right, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, just some random thoughts about having diabetes, what it's like. First of all, probably the main thing about having diabetes is undergoing lows and highs. So when you go low blood sugar, it, uh, it feels like your whole body is just like slowing down. It feels like you're, you're in slow motion. And I, I've, I've felt like, like my brain um, isn't functioning right. Um, when you're high blood sugar, uh, at least in my case, and I think maybe it's different for everybody, but um, I get pretty hyper, I get pretty fidgety. Um, uh, my brain's running a million miles an hour. Um, if I'm really high, uh, it's, it's kind of um, a different feeling. I, I just don't feel good. Uh, it start, you start to feel kind of crummy when you're super high. If you're just a little high, um, you know, it, you're just kind of moving in fast motion, if that makes sense. So uh, a low can be caused by too much insulin and a high can be caused by not enough insulin for when you eat. Um, but it's not a simple equation of, um, you know, when you eat, you give yourself insulin. Um, every food you eat uh, affects your body differently and requires different amount of insulin. And some people, some people will ask me, um, you know, when I'm, I'm drinking a, a pop and they, they're like, oh man, that must be so hard for you to drink. And it's like, no, pop is like one of the easiest things uh, to balance. It's very quick. Um, it, it burns through your body very quick and the insulin um, burns through the pop very quick. One of the hardest things for me to eat would be like pizza or pasta or some of these heavier carbs that are, are longer lasting. Um, like pizza, I'll eat pizza and, and take insulin and maybe two, three hours later, all of a sudden I'll have like a, a second wave where the, the pizza raises my blood sugar two, three hours down the line. Um, cereal is a very hard thing to eat. If you eat cereal first thing in the morning, you'll just, you'll spike way up in the air. It's, it's just a very quick carb um, and I'm, I'm, I'm guessing it's kind of designed that way. Um, so, so all different types of food affect um, your blood sugar. And it's, it's always a challenge to guess how many carbs you're eating and how those carbs will affect your body. Um, one of the first things they teach you when you get diabetes is how to count how many carbs you're eating um, and kind of know the general amount of carbs entering your body. Um, but just because you know the carbs doesn't mean you'll nail the insulin dosage just because there's lots of other factors in play. One of those factors is exercise. If you sit still all day, um, your insulin's not going to work very well. If you're moving around all day, sometimes your insulin almost works too well and you experience lows. Um, and so um, you have to kind of learn how your body works. Um, I know that it's, it's really good for me to, to go on a walk first thing in the morning or, or work out. Um, and if I work out late at night, I'll most likely have a low after I go to sleep. And so you, you learn how exercise and carbs affects your blood sugar. Um, and there's, there's other things like heat, the temperature outside. Uh, when I'm working on the farm and I'm sweating and it's humid, um, it burns blood sugar like crazy. Uh, in the winter, I find that I have to use a lot more insulin because um, there's just not as much uh, heat burning off sugar. So, so um, temperature affects blood sugar, food, exercise. Um, there's, there's many, many variables that, that go into it, which is another reason why you can't really tell someone, oh, you're not, you're not taking care of yourself because you're having a lower high. And it's like, well, you don't really know the environment they've been in, the variables they're facing. So there's a, a few things to remember uh, when you get diabetes. Um, you always want to have uh, the ability to know your blood sugar um, wherever you go. Uh, so for me, um, I farm and then I also travel for a living and both of those things uh, can be pretty complicated to always have food with me to eat and always have um, my blood sugar, knowing what my blood sugar is. 
Um, my pump, uh, when it's calibrated, knows my blood sugar at all times. And that's been a huge lifesaver, both on the farm and on the road. Um, but if, if it's uncalibrated, uh, I need to prick my finger uh, to know my blood sugar. So I carry a, I call them a pricker. I don't really know. I guess they're a meter, a blood sugar meter. Um, but I take one of those. I have one in my truck. I have one at the farm. I have one in my office. I have one upstairs. I have one in my book bag for when I travel. Um, I carry those everywhere I go. Um, just, you know, just in case you never want to be without one of those, um, because you won't know your blood sugar. Um, and then you never want to be without food or access to food as well, which uh, can be tough. Um, when I go out to the farm, I'm rotating between tractor to combine to, you know, shop to different fields. And I, I basically carry a book bag with me at all times, um, that has my stuff in it. It has Gatorade. It's got food, um, that can... The Gatorade raises my blood sugar quickly, and then the food kind of helps balance it out. And so um, that's when you when you go when you go really low, you're going to feel really terrible. You want something that can bring you up really quickly, whether that's juice or Gatorade or uh, I've found any type of like liquid uh, sugar brings you up quickly and makes you feel better in, in like less than five minutes. If you eat food when you're low, it may take you know 10, 15, 20 minutes. And so it's it's a big difference. It's worth having uh, liquid sugar. There's been a couple times where I've been um, like stranded on the farm uh, and like maybe I don't have cell phone reception or, or something happens. And that, that's a very scary thing when you're a type one diabetic uh, to be stranded without communication, without food. Um, and so that's the number one thing that you have to keep in the back of your mind all the time. You have to have access to food or, or, or sugar drink um, or uh, have the ability to communicate with someone who can get you that food. So that's, that's the really dangerous part about it, is, um, is getting yourself in a bad situation like that. So whenever I'm farming, whenever I'm traveling, um, like I've, I've taken off on a plane before and not had food with me, and I'm, I'm going low, I'm feeling terrible, and everyone's seat belted in, I've had to hit the, the call button to get the flight attendant to come because um, you know it's kind of an emergency situation and she, she brought me um, a sugary drink. So um, a lot of lows for me happen at night um, after I've gone to sleep. Sleep. Um, a lot of times it's from eating too late at night and having to guess the insulin for that and then uh, you go to sleep and maybe you took too much insulin you wake up at 3 a.m. you feel you feel terrible you're laying in bed and you have to get up out of bed at 3 a.m. and you know eat a granola bar drink some juice and then try to go back to sleep and it's not a, that's not a fun um, process I can't tell you how many nights I've sat on the couch over here um, and you have to wait about 10 minutes before you feel good enough to try to go back to sleep. And uh, as far as like weight management and you know what's healthy for you, the same thing is healthy for me as what's healthy for you. And getting up at 3 a.m. and eating food and drinking sugar is not that healthy of a thing, but you have to do it. It's not, it's not a choice. And so um, those that if you just um, got diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, that's something that, uh, you know, s losing sleep is definitely a huge part of type 1 diabetes. It's one of the biggest challenges. Um, my life is busy enough as it is. When, you add, when I added type 1 diabetes into the mix, um, it's very time consuming and it, it definitely takes away your sleep and it takes away a lot of uh, thinking. You're, you're constantly thinking about managing your blood sugar. So it takes a part of your brain. Another part of uh, type 1 diabetes is I have um, a doctor appointment every three months where I meet with my uh, endocrinologist and um, they basically advise me, um, they, they download my pump onto um, like a computer software program and they can analyze how I've been doing, they can analyze my carb ratio um, if they need to, to change anything with how the pump uh, responds to what I'm uh, typing in. Um, and they, I, I, I do a blood test every three months that determines my A1C, which is like a three month average of my blood sugar. Um, you want your A1C to be measurements from like six to 11. And I'm usually between six and seven and a half. Um, so I, I'm still on the good side of things, but I've also only had type one for three and a half years. So, um, you know, it, you can develop some insulin resistance. You can develop some some, um, I guess, apathy toward it. I'm sure if you've had type 1 diabetes for 20 years, you're maybe a little less motivated than you were when you first got it. But um, so far, I've had really good numbers. Um, my wife has to go to the pharmacy uh, maybe once a week or maybe once every couple weeks to pick up uh, new set changes. 
you pull the plunger back and it starts to fill with, with insulin to plug your, your vial into your pump. And it goes right in. Sometimes it hurts worse than others. Uh, Any time um, that I want to like play a sport or go swimming or take a shower or go through airport security, I just disconnect this right here. Both of these set changes, what it does is it sticks a needle um, into my skin, into the bloodstream, but then it, when you when you pull it out, it, it pulls the needle out. There's not, con yeah, it, it retracts the needle. It's not constantly leaving a needle in your skin. It's, I think it's called like a cannula. Um, it's just like a, I think it's just like a plastic. Um, you can't feel it like you can feel a needle. And so that's kind of how it works. It's just a tubing that, that goes, yeah, it's flexible. It yeah. goes in your skin, so. So we'll clean the, clean the spot. Here we go. finished product. It takes a couple hours to warm up, but after that, um, it'll be ready to take uh, calibrations from my meter. And so I'll, I'll prick my finger like three, four, five times, um, like maybe once every hour, and then type that number into my pump. And my pump, oh, the, the transmitter always has a, a blood sugar number that it's thinking that my blood sugar is, um, but it's not always right. So that's why you calibrate, um, because you don't want your number on your on your sensor and your pump to be wrong. So my Medtronic uh, 670G pump actually has an auto feature on it that um, it takes the reading of the blood sugar from my arm, it's Bluetooth to my pump, and my pump actually responds to that number and gives me more or less insulin based on that number. And it's not the most aggressive thing ever. I'm much more aggressive when I type in insulin doses manually but it does help when I'm busy working on the farm or busy traveling. I don't have to constantly, you know, I don't have to give myself all the insulin I'm getting. This auto feature, um, it, it, it responds to my body. And so that is one of the um, brilliant technologies that is out there that wasn't out there 10 years ago. And so I'm very thankful for auto mode, but auto mode, just like insulin pumps, um, it's not perfect. And, you, and if you rely on the technology too much, it can get you into trouble. I've had uh, my number be over 100 points off and about send me to the hospital because I go so low. Or um, I've also been a lot higher than I thought I was and um, thinking that I was having a really good day. And then I prick my finger at night and oh, I've actually been at 250 all day instead of 150. And so you can't rely too much on your technology, but the technology definitely makes things easier. I've also heard um, from like younger type one diabetics um, that when you have type 1 diabetes as a kid, um, your body's still changing, you're growing, you're going through puberty, different things like that. And um, just like anything, uh, it can make your blood sugar go haywire and managing it one year of your life is gonna be totally different than managing it another year of your life, which I didn't have to go through that. And uh, I'm, I'm thankful every day that I didn't get type 1 diabetes earlier than 26. Um, I was very lucky in that aspect. And, and I can focus on I can focus on the negative that um, I got it. I got it at 26. I have type 1 diabetes. This sucks. I can focus on that, or you can choose to focus on the positive things, such as I didn't have it for 26 years of my life, which I'm very thankful for. So the the two hardest um, things about diabetes that I think um, I deal with uh, would be the inconvenience. Um, it is it is so annoying. I cannot tell you how annoying type 1 diabetes is. Um, about almost every hour of my life. It is, it is taking a part of my brain, a part of my focus. Um, it's, it's distracting me from the task at hand if I go low or high or if my pump is buzzing, telling me that I'm low or high or uncalibrated. Um, it's, it's you know, having to remember to take all these things different places and to, to, to you know, every time I eat, I have to be thinking. And it's, it's funny, sometimes I'll, I'll think back to before I had type one diabetes and, and like, man, like you have it so good. You can just, you can eat whenever, whatever. Uh, you know, there's, there's not as much consequence to eating and uh, your, your, your brain just is not thinking about all that stuff. So um, the inconvenience of diabetes is for sure the hardest thing about it. Um, but at the same time, you know, there's, there's a lot worse diseases out there that are far beyond inconvenient. Um, they're debilitating. So um, I can't complain too much about being inconvenienced all the time. Um, any type 1 diabetic is higher at risk uh, for heart disease, stroke, kidney disease, nerve, disease, nerve damage, and eye disease. Um, 
five uh, pretty major things there. Um, and that is for sure motivation to take care of myself and make good decisions and, and do the best I can. Um, but at the same time, um, even if you're doing the best you can, you're still at higher risk for those things. Even the, the best managed diabetes uh, is still at risk, uh, higher at risk than, than a normal person who's making those same good decisions. And so um, that kind of goes back to um, we can do anything we want as type 1 diabetics, but we, we have it harder. It's, it's more challenging um, because we have that disease. And so that is something I keep in the back of my mind is, is that that's, that's really hard to come to grips with is, yes, there could be complications down the road. At the same time, there is hope. I do feel like um, technology is increasing. Um, getting diagnosed at 26, I have access to far greater technology than if I'd have gotten diagnosed at six years old. 20 years ago, um, it, was, it was a totally different ball game. So um, I think for 20 years down the road from now, when I'm 50 years old, um, there could be new technology that, that I haven't even thought of. And so there's hope um, that, that it could get even better. Um, but for now, um, I do want to take the best care of myself that I can. Uh, now for the best parts of diabetes. Um, the answer to that question is there really is no best part of diabetes. There's no good thing about it. Um, but I guess what I would call them is silver linings. There's a couple silver linings that I've found. Um, first is that uh, you kind of have a chip on your shoulder and um, it's, it's a little extra motivation to, to live life to the, to the fullest and to, to prove uh, to people that, that you can still do all these things even though you have type 1 diabetes. I hope that, that everyone who watched this video who is a type 1 diabetic or, or maybe who just got diagnosed, um, I hope you can hear this message that it, it doesn't have to limit you. Um, it's going to be more challenging, but, but you can do anything that you want to do. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Um, I am going to close with uh, basically a Facebook post um, that I wrote about a year after uh, getting diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And I really feel like, I feel like this sums up um, kind of some of uh, the silver lining uh, of having type 1 diabetes. There's really no good things about it, um, but I do feel like there's, there's a few silver linings at least uh, for me. So um, every morning uh, when I have type 1 diabetes, I wake up uh, thankful that God has given me another day to live and that, that I still have life. Um, if I'd have gotten diabetes, type 1 diabetes 100 years ago, it was a death sentence. There was no hope. Uh, today there is hope. Um, diabetes also reminds me of my fragility. Um, it humbles me and it is a thorn in my side. And these are actually good things. Um, the more that I rely on my own strength and my own understanding, uh, the further away I am from relying on God. Uh, in the Bible it says that cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from his flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. He shall dwell in the parched place of the wilderness. Diabetes is a constant reminder for me to trust God every day. I can't put my trust and my hope in my own body, um, but I can put my trust in the Lord. Uh, it's, in the Bible it says, Blessed is he who trusts in the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water. It is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Um, I actually feel blessed by diabetes, and I don't have to worry about it because God will use it for his good and for my good. Um, he can use anything in our lives, uh, no matter how tough the situation, uh, no matter how hard it is to believe. Um, as one of my favorite songs uh, by Switchfoot, the song Where I Belong says, um, I'm not sentimental, this skin and bones is a rental, and no one makes it out alive. This body's not my home, and this world is not my own. I will be cured from type 1 diabetes someday, whether it's in this life or the next. All the world's ailments, brokenness, abuse, poverty, pain, suffering, and death will be cured someday as well. Uh, Jesus will come to make all things new. Uh, it's important for all of us to draw near to Him. Uh, the joy, peace, and fulfillment from His love surpasses all understanding and is available to each of us right now. Christians don't have to fear the hard things in life. Um, we don't have to put our trust in ourselves or in this broken world. Our hope is in something greater and something um, far more everlasting. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, but inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. 
So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So thanks for watching, everyone. I hope that uh, gives you some encouragement and some education, and I uh, just appreciate you taking the time to listen.